ITV. The following program is rated G, general programming. Tomega Entertainment, in association with Muskeg Lake Cree Nation, presents A Jet Streaks Across the Sky. This is Corner One, three ship TF-18, inbound for Canada, remember our heroes. Corner One, report initial for one runway 27. Corner One, initial 27, here we go. The soldiers ride in the back of a truck, pose for a photo on a jet engine, and salute the Canadian flag. Military personnel celebrate, and veterans march in a parade. Canada remembers our heroes. Tostego. Written by Jeff Martell. On September the 1st, 1939, Canadians learned that Adolf Hitler's Nazi Germany had invaded Poland. With a declaration of war against Germany on September the 10th, Canada's war effort began in earnest. In Canada, Many immediately volunteered to join the military, and more than one million Canadians, Newfoundlanders, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit eventually served in the Second World War. Canadian pilots and air crews served in both the Royal Canadian Air Force and in the British Royal Air Force, and played an important role in the air defense of Britain during the Blitz, as the German Luftwaffe launched countless air attacks from September 1940 to May 1941. More than 93,000 Canadian soldiers served with the Allied forces in Italy as they made headway against the German and Italian forces. A land invasion in France became inevitable. On June 6, 1944, one of the largest military operations in history, Operation Overlord, sent 156,000 British, American, and Canadian soldiers to the beaches of Normandy to liberate Europe from the grip of Nazi Germany. A map shows the planned attack. Quote, Protecting and making people aware of our own history. More than seven decades after the end of the Second World War, many Canadians and First Nations people have connections to veterans and the liberation of Europe that have played a part in shaping their lives. A boy smiles. Zach Perdue learned the importance of service and sacrifice from his grandfather, Joseph Perdue a Second World War veteran. Joseph served in the Royal Canadian Navy and survived a torpedo attack that left him with severe burns. Despite his injuries, he returned to serve until the end of the war. Zach honored his grandfather by attending the 75th anniversary of D-Day in 2019, along with his high school class. I've always been inspired to learn about history and World War II my whole life because I've had multiple, I believe four members of my family serve uh, in both the World Wars. And so I was really inspired by them to go learn on this trip to find out more and in detail about what happened to them and what they truly went through uh, during this horrible time of our history. So the liberation of Europe and France is everything, truly. It, it's what saved us. My name is Jenna Swidrovich. I am 26 years old. I was born here in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Um, I was a part of Canada Remembers Air Shows my entire life. The first one was developed in 1995, and I was born in 1994, so I was one. Yeah, I've just been around them my entire life. I would talk with vets. I would hear their stories, even if it wasn't even about their past. It, it could honestly just be about their day or their family or maybe who they lost. Hearing their stories, especially back then, is something that I will remember. My grandfather went through the same thing. He was 17 when he entered uh, the Navy for Canada. He was in an orphanage and lied about his age to get away from that. And I, I can't imagine for anyone that was that age or even a few years older, it it's truly incredible the fact that you're able to get yourself out of the situation here, go across to another country you've never been in, and go and fight for people here. So the fact that we can thrive today and have the country that we know and love is Canada today. Nursing student, Jenna. Another thing that is kind of hard to talk about is um, 
when the vets marched every time at the air show and um, seeing how whew, seeing how emotional it made my dad every single time there would be tears in his eyes tears in my eyes and especially as I got older and could understand what you know that was all about and after being educated on it by my dad and my mom it it's something I will like n never forget my name is Colonel Malcolm Young retired a 33 year veteran of the Canadian Armed Forces Canada has a proud tradition of service. Many people from different backgrounds, walks of life, ethnicities, countries, have served in the Canadian military throughout our history. But of note is the significant contribution of our Aboriginal and Métis veterans who have participated in every conflict throughout the history of this country, dating back to the War of 1812, to present day operations in places like Afghanistan and other operations that are ongoing today. In World War II, like World War I, many Aboriginal veterans, citizens, came off reserved, joined the Canadian Army, Air Force, and Navy, and served with a great contribution and dignity. Harry LaFond, I come from uh, Muskeg Lake Cree Nation, and uh, right now I'm serving as a, a counselor and have been for the last uh, 14 years. That's after serving the community as a chief for 10 years uh, during the 1990s. I'm an educator, I've trained as a teacher, and I have developed a really keen interest in protecting and making people aware of our own history. The Cree people, the community of Muskeg Lake, uh, the individuals that come from our communities that have uh, achieved a lot, but have remained fairly unknown. My brother Bert, was the first in our family to enlist, and he enlisted during the Second World War, coming out of residential school. In his life, he carried the two wars, and uh, he carried them by himself, really. You know, it, it was there to the day he took his last breath. It wasn't something that he really learned how to let go over his lifetime, and it, it showed in the way he uh, tried to cover things up. How many Royal Canadian Air Force squadrons supported the Allied D-Day invasion? 15? 10? 39? 22? Coming up, a Canadian Second World War veteran visits a German 109 Messerschmitt build. Canada remembers our heroes. Canada remembers our heroes. The Royal Canadian Air Force provided 39 squadrons supporting the Allied D-Day invasion. Five of those aircraft, along with their crews, were lost. Our target that night was two German field guns. I heard later it was D-Day. Retired Colonel Malcolm Young. Air support air power was critical to the success of uh, supporting the Allies during the D-Day invasion. It took two forms. First of all, Bomber Command, of which 6th Group Royal Canadian Air Force was part of, was responsible for heavy bombardment of key targets within the invasion zone prior to and during the invasion itself. They focused on fortifications, routes of advance the Germans would take, enemy reserve concentration areas, and other key vital points. Unfortunately, the weather on June 5th and 6th did not allow Bomber Command to effectively engage the targets that they had pre-identified. Low-level conditions, cloud cover, did not give them direct line of sight on those targets, and in many cases, bombs fell beyond their intended target. In addition to that, the bombs themselves were ineffective. They did not penetrate the fortifications the Germans had built in many cases, i.e. the bombs were not strong enough to bust the concrete fortifications. However, some success was achieved. Bomber Command was able to turn around and disrupt enemy communication lines and, in some cases, effectively engage enemy reserve concentrations. A man meets an older gentleman. Hi, Rich. Welcome to the 109 factory. Oh, oh it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Well, fine. Uh, I hear you were in 430 Moon Squadron. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And still work for five now, right? That's right, exactly. Well, that's a great honor to have you here. Yeah. I'm happy that you could make it. Rich Harrison served in the Royal Canadian Air Force in the Second World War, surviving four crashes and 19 combat missions, including air support during the D-Day invasion. They inspect war relics. 
drones and things like that. Uh, Don Bradshaw is a World War II vintage airplane enthusiast and an aviation mechanical instructor. He has rebuilt several aircraft, including a Halifax and two German 109 Messerschmitts. Rich Harrison, and our target that night was uh, two German, what they call German field guns. Yes. They were massive. They were able to lob shells into the English Channel. And that wow. was a place called Merville. It's probably seven or eight miles inland. I think they sent about 135 bombers on that particular raid. And uh, the Germans had uh, those guns uh, underneath concrete. It was about four feet thick with three bars in it to cover the barrels of the guns. And we found out later that most of it, we had 500, we had, each plane had 18 500 pound armor piercing bombs. And we understand later that most of them just tossed off like tennis balls. Wow. When I heard later that it was D-Day and what was happening on, on the beaches, I was really glad that uh, I was up in the air because I understand there was over 7,000 ships in the English Channel. Yes, you know, it was very, very oh, busy. Yeah. The overall objectives of the D-Day campaign we know from the operations order of off Overlord was basically to secure a lodgement, to establish a national beachhead and a lodgement area to allow for the build-up reinforcements to carry on future offensive operations. It was broken down into two phases. Phase one was the securing of the lodgement based upon five beachheads interconnected, the capture of Caen, the city of Caen, and the port of Sherbrooke. Phase two was to expand the initial lodgement area achieved in phase one and then turn around and capture all ports south of Loire, all the way to through to the Seine. And in doing so, that would prepare the Allies both for the breakout from the lodgement, but more importantly, give them the port facilities, which would allow them to bring in millions more troops and equipment and supplies necessary to carry on with the overall invasion of Northwest Europe. Quotes. A few guys were lying on the beach. I thought they were taking cover. Jim Parks was not yet 18 years old when he joined the Royal Winnipeg Rifles during the Second World War. He was among the many Canadian soldiers who landed on Juneau Beach during the D-Day invasion. But our, our boat, we had to, they dropped us off in water too deep. Our, our mortar carriers went into the water and we ended up swimming. So it was quite a ways from shore. I'd say, I, I thought it was about 100 yards or so, but the wind and the waves are coming right to left because it made us drift. Now on the way there, I was trying to swim into shore. I got sideswiped by a one of the landing craft come in and you get pushed into the water and all I could see was stars because I swallowed a lot of water, right? You see stars and, and I foot touched the touched the bottom and it gave you a little drill and I popped up. And I started still started to wing my way into the water into the shore and uh, I caught the shortest few guys lying on the beach. I thought they're taking cover. I ran like heck to this one guy and I plopped down and it, uh, it was, uh, I remember his name because I got his stuff. It was Corporal Scape. He'd be mortally wounded right on the beach. So I got beside him and I, I ended up taking his stand gun because he was a corporal. He had a stand gun with a light machine gun right? And I took his backpack because I lost everything coming in. A young soldier smiles in an old photo. Ken Newell grew up in the Maritimes before joining the Canadian military. He became a radio operator before landing with the Allied forces in the second wave of D-Day operations in Normandy, France. So we moved to the boat in the fourth, and uh, then the storm came up, and so we stayed on the boat two nights, the night of the fourth, the night of the fifth, and we headed out the next day. It was pretty rough. And uh, we went in, the, I got a picture of the boat, and we went on too. I crossed in, we went in about 10 miles to the coast, and then I looked, crawled on a scrambling net, a smaller boat, and we went I spotted the guy on the beach, uh, uh, Corporal Martin, I uh, turned up to be Corporal Martin, but the guy was right by the edge of the beach, I could see him moving, so I went down and I, I got him back to 
to where the pillbox from beside the pillbox and Jack got a couple more and we and he said uh, Martin said hold me my cold and Jack held him for a while and I held him for a while and he died there. His couple Martin said he was from uh, somewhere in Manitoba or Saskatchewan. He'd been he'd been hit. Right? So he died right there. He died in uh, died in their arms. Oh, that was about uh, two days after D Day. Uh, you you heard till a Benny Shermier the funeral the bar, uh, the, Yeah. Uh, but just beyond the and it was this ridge. And uh, I noticed a bunch of tanks were huddled oh. down, I just had the turret above the hill. And I figured there was something something going on there, but I should have I should have learned, learned it to make it. He didn't notice it. I figured there was something going on. And so he kept on going and went down this, this grade and one sh uh, was a tank in the corner there. He fired at us once and hit the mud in front of us. And so we all jumped out. He couldn't turn around and beat us, so we all turned around and jumped us along this bank with the elbow beside this house. Uh, so, you know, there, you could hear the machine guns, boats going by us. And we had to crawl back to the the uh, green field to our own mind. Yeah. Oh, well, it's lucky day or two. <laughs> if he'd have got us for the first shot, we'd have been gone. Pretty brutal. You not only you have the shell fire, you got all the dead animals around, the smell of the dead animals, and you can always tell them a dead human, because they're different, and it smells worse. I remember uh, there's one spot for the second day in, we had to move up our reserve and move over to take over another, another, another battalion. And we passed this field, and he'd taken the, the rifles, put the bayonet on, and stuck it in the ground, and put the helmet on. And this, this field must have been about 60 or 70 helmets, German and Canadian helmets, identified where the body was. Yeah. Of the 156,000 Allied troops that participated in the D-Day invasion, how many were Canadians? 10,000? 5,000? 9,000? 14,000? Coming up, Canadians become liberators in Europe. Canada remembers our heroes. Canada remembers our heroes. 14,000 Canadians took part in the Allied invasion of Normandy on D-Day. Quote, Canadian Army's mission, free Holland. Colonel Malcolm Young. The major objectives of the Allies uh, through the invasion of France um, were really focused on seizing key major urban areas. Ken Newell. But, uh, our, our worst time in Normandy was at Carpegate. You know how to carry carpet gate? The airport. Yeah. What happened next? Well, we started on uh, July the fourth. It was. Had a, it was kind of like Vimy Ridge. They had a creeping barrage, and because it was about a mile across, they you couldn't go across without so that. So they had a creeping barrage, and you fall right really close to it. You know, as a mm -hmm. real barrage moved ahead, you go under it. You know. Once we got to cross, I started starting to get a only, only bit about uh, half an hour out from the start line. And uh, I made up a long cord so I could operate my radio so they would be in the carrier. And a shell landed right in the carrier and killed the fire. Yeah, the driver. Smoke engulfs a battlefield. Jim Parks. In the battle itself, they, we end up getting uh, four battalions plus some tanks to go in and get to, to get to the town of Carpiquet and the Carpiquet airfield. And everybody, everybody lost a few. We, our regiment lost a few because extra because we were in a, uh, a unique position by, by the airport. We had a long open field to go across, and a lot of people were in the open. Open we were exposed to shelling and machine gun fire. So we had only 989 casualties that day. Later in August, their focus was on seizing Paris. That was done in conjunction with Free French Forces, so the French Resistance, 
and the rising up of the French people against the Germans. And so the Allies' whole goal was to turn around, seize both urban areas, German headquarters locations, and airfields to allow for the continued advancement of the Allied forces through France. And by the close of September 1944, uh, the Allies have been effective in basically retaking France. Edward Pelkey joined the Canadian military and served first in Italy. When the Italian campaign swung decisively for the Allies, his unit was transferred to France to continue the liberation of Europe. When they rolled into Paris, Eisenhower said, we'll let Mr. Leclerc do it. He was a French free a general in the French, free French army. Americans could have taken that city. They were right on the outskirts. They weren't going to march through the city as liberators. He said, no, let's not do that. We'll let Leclerc do it. It's his, it's his city, really. They're French. And then we went up and just made a short skirt into Germany and right back into Holland. And that was the Canadian Army's mission, free Holland. And uh, that was not a, as easy as, it think, as you'd think. The recapturing and the liberation of Holland was a key strategic objective of the Canadian Army. After the successes of 1944, where the Allies were able to recapture both France and Belgium from German forces, the focus turned in 1945 to the liberation of Holland. The Canadian, First Canadian Army was assigned key operational tasks of both securing and seizing objectives in northeastern and western Netherlands, or Holland as we know it. And we were instructed in Holland not to wantingly or destroy property. Save it if you can. But if they hole up in these houses and start offering a lot of resistance, we just have to take it out. And our tanks were setting back. Our infantry was ahead. The tanks were right here. And if there was machine gun fire coming from that house, you didn't put a bunch of men out there to get shot. The tank come up close enough. He swung his gun around and down. He raises his hands, minding surrender. Then if there's anybody living, they come out. Nick Janicki joined the Canadian Army in 1942. He was part of the Canadian contingent that provided reinforcements to the Allied liberation of Europe. And when I, when we went into it, Amateur, we, we crossed, uh, we went from a place that was a kind of a, an asylum. No, there was nobody occupied there. We went in there overnight, and the next day, about it was just afternoon, that we had to cross uh, this this open field, at maybe four or five hundred yards across the open field, and, and tank ditches were dug by the Germans there to get into this to start our liberation of the city of Devonshire. Crossed the road and got into an open area, and and. Laying there, and there was one of these back houses eh, that they had there. The, the Germans had a, I guess it was a, like an anti-aircraft weapon or something, a 20 millimeter explosive shell thing. And it was just chopping this here building right down. And I was laying there, and this other chap, old Dad Taylor, he was a corporal. He says, he says, hey kid, keep your head down. He says, they're fire. It's like I remember that. And we went and finally went in, and they had made a pincher to the right, one of, one of the companies, and taken out the weapon, and then we were into the edge of the city and started to liberate. And that's where we took the first, first two prisoners we had, our first three prisoners we had. Edward Pelkey of the Carlton York Regiment. It was the awful feeling that... I might get killed the next hour or the next minute. But it's hard to kind of put in words, but you lived with that every day. A bullet just misses a soldier. As the song says, the foe lies around every bend. And is he going to get me? That was the major thing about the feelings was every time you put an attack, who was going to be missing tomorrow? If we get through to tomorrow, who will be not? Who will 
maybe somebody won't get here. And it's a lifetime. What the Germans did was they employed delaying tactics. They would employ booby traps within buildings. They would deploy minefields in key routes of advance. They would use snipers positioned uh, in positions of observation where they could engage Allied uh, forces at a, at a long distance, specifically focused on killing leaders, as an example. Um, all these tactics were used really to turn around and slow down the advance of the Allies to erode the morale of Allied soldiers, because you never knew when you were going to hit the next mine, or you never knew where the next bow trap was, or you never knew when the next sniper bullet was going to come. But there's some, some mines they couldn't find, that little shoe mines you pull your foot off. They used metal detectors. They had no metal in them, they wouldn't pick it up. See, they're made out of wood. The only <coughs> thing metal in them, I think, was a detonator, and sometimes it wouldn't pick it up. Well, well, we didn't find them all. We lost some guys. Not the, the, the blow your foot off. They wanted you to get wounded. They take two or three to carry you, and you're back in the hospital. They wanted to do that. Jim Parks. The second or the third day in, we had to go and take this village, and there's a tank. One of the tanks, one of the tanks that got farther in in the infantry, and they suddenly got knocked out. And this one tank. It's a, one guy was going to go climb in and see what was in there, and uh, somebody hollered, it was booby trapped. So we all had to keep away from the booby trappers. And there was actually the soldiers, the tank men were still inside. But the Germans had booby trapped somewhere around the, uh, the cockpit. So you had to wait for the engineers to come along. They searched for mines by a destroyed tank. No. He had a wash of them, though. The Germans were sometimes to be a shell that hit the pavement. And put up some mud, and sometimes they put a mine in the hole, and sometimes they put a mine in the mud, come out of the hole, so you had to steer, steer around them, they couldn't go near them. Yeah. Crouched by a post, an engineer holds a mine. All kinds of trickery. Yeah. On which day of the year does the Netherlands celebrate the end of Nazi occupation? May the 7th, June 6th, May 5th, November 7th. Coming up, the struggle to liberate Holland continues. Canada remembers our heroes. Always accessible, always described. Canada remembers our heroes. The Netherlands celebrates the end of the Nazi occupation in World War II on the 5th of May, which is a public holiday. Quote, Canadians learned quickly what urban warfare was all about. Colonel Young. What the Germans also did was they turned around and they fortified villages all throughout Holland. Uh, and the Canadians learned quickly what urban warfare was all about in terms of having to seize villages house by house, village by village in terms of the Germans conducting delaying operations. Edward Pelkey. And that's what we did in, in uh, Holland. We went from village to village. And the first city that we came to was uh, Appledorn. There were some of the first troops of the city. We went up to the outskirts and camped and uh, just on the ground. And the next day, he said, we're going through one way or another. Well, the next day, the Germans were fleeing. They were going the other way. We didn't have to have the town all apart. But the population was something you couldn't believe. After four or five years, they come out with their flags, you know, and, and cheering the troops on. and give you a pretty good heart. I think somebody cared. Thomas DeRoche grew up in Alberta and joined the Canadian Army with some of his friends. He was among the Canadian reinforcements that landed in Calais, France, after D-Day. And then we had to travel right into Nijmegen, Holland. I think it was a six-hour ride. Oh, my God, I suffered all that six hours. Anyway, we jumped off, and, we, and uh, the sergeant there that, you know, that's there ahead of us, uh, 
was telling us to go to that old ramshackle building, half of it was standing, and just go over there. And the lot we could hear uh, firing like, you know, a rifle range or something. One of the boys said, yeah. Oh, he said, you got a rifle range here. And the sergeant looked, they asked, but he heard the target. He said, oh, 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 oh. Jim Parks. Going across this field, and on one side of it, they had this fence. And I could see all these little t t pinging on the fence. I didn't realize what they were until all of a sudden I look up, there's an air burst, a bird thing up in front of me. So I, I just ran like heck as far as I could. There's about 30 yards away, there's a house. He had this window. So I ran towards this window and I got one foot on the window sill and I got a duck down like this and a shell landed right up behind me. And that's the last I remember I saw a flash. The screen goes black. People in the room, they said it blew me across the room and there's one of these in Holland and Germany, they have these beds that are in the, hall, in the wall, they pull it. That was pulled open and it blew me across underneath that bed and jammed me there and they pulled me out by the, by the legs and I was unconscious. But we had to search everyone for firearms of any kind. Uh, one of our corporals, Jerry was his name. He was good hearted. He, we always had a chocolate bar or something here. And there's a 10 year old boy there. And, and uh, he called him over and he was reaching in here. He handed him a chocolate bar, right? You know? And that kid had a Luger and shot him in the stomach here. Oh, one of the boys had a 20 shot mag on that gun. Just emptied it on that kid there. You know? That's the horrible part. The very horrible. On October the 10th, 1945, the Hitler Youth and its subordinated units were outlawed by the Allied Control Council along with other Nazi party organizations. A Nazi poster glorifies child soldiers. Nick Janicki. When we went into the city, of course, we were, uh, uh, the Germans were still dropping mortars in some of the squares, and as you came around corners, there were still people firing, eh? and, but they were on the run. I can remember this one, we came around the corner and there was mortars dropping, so I headed down some steps, the front steps into the basement of the area, and there was a few more of our guys just waiting it out, I guess. And I can remember pulling my, this pouch that I had, an ammunition pouch, to, to flop it, flop me on the back as I was running, and pull it over, and I kept a little carton of tin of cigarettes in it, eh? and so I decided it's time for a smoke, and I pulled this thing over and opened it, pulled this tin out, and opened the tin, and it was just pulverized. And then I looked at the tin, and here's a groove right across it, like it was shrapnel or a bullet. I looked down at my tunic, it tore across here, too. So, boy, I'll tell you, I sweated it. I said, not my turn today. And there's two of us in these trench. And just the last night we were there, we, uh, I think we spent two nights there. The last night we were there, and I fell asleep in the trench, you know, out of sight like this, and my buddy was watching there, just with his helmet across. And, and anyway, when I woke up, well, you could hear the firing going to beat heck of you. And when I woke up, I said, oh, what's happening? And there was no answer. He was dead. He got a, just under his element, that's where he was hit by the bullet thing. Yeah. Because the machine gun bullets are flying all over him. You know. Oh, I didn't know what to think, you know. And so anyway, I got out of there and I ruled, you don't walk around or you're dead right now, eh? Or you don't stand still for five seconds, you're dead too. You gotta move and move fast. I ran into this one building and I had no more uh, what you call it, uh, uh, them uh, hand grenades. Usually carry four or five in the back here, eh? but they use them. And I couldn't throw anything up there on the top window. That's what you usually do. Eh? And uh, anyway, I was just starting to come out and my buddy across was doing this, you know, and I jumped back, but my boots are got hobnails and them horseshoes on the bottom and on cobblestones you were just like on ice and I, my foot slipped like this 
And I felt something hit my foot, but that was all. But that was that machine gun, see? And, but he got him right away, like, you know, from across the street. With a grenade. And I didn't really feel anything. Until I kept running like this until I came to the end of the building. And I got around across like this, away from the street. And uh, see, my foot felt wet like it was so good. Water in it. Can't be, it's dry. So I sat down and then took my boot off and my sock just full of blood. Eh? And just that time, one of our officers was running around the corner and he seen that, hey, you said you're going back, just like that, eh? you know. In Wagenbergen, the next day, we dug in, in trenches outside of the city and stayed in trenches all day, waiting to go in that night, which we did under our own shell fire. And you, you went in there, German soldiers, you're still fighting your way through the city. And they, they were, we weren't the only company there because there was probably Regina rifles, Winnipeg rifles that were there too. And they forced, them, forced all the German troops right out of the city and out of there and cleared the city. How many German soldiers surrendered on the Western Front between D-Day and the end of April 1945? 1 1.3 million? 2.8 million? 1.5 million? 250,000? Coming up, the end of the Second World War. Canada remembers our heroes. Canada remembers our heroes. From D-Day to the end of April 1945, 2.8 million German soldiers surrendered. World War II ended in Europe on May 8, 1945, when Germany surrendered unconditionally. Quotes. They marched back to Germany on foot. The column was four miles long. Colonel Malcolm Young. Early 1945, as the Allies were able to turn around and secure uh, key objectives and liberate Holland, it led to the successful crossing of the Rhine, and where the Allied forces were actually able to penetrate into the motherland of Germany. The Germans were now faced with a two-pronged attack. The British, Canadians, and Americans advancing through Northwest Europe, but you had the Russian forces advancing from the east, and now the Germans were being pressured on two fronts a pincer in effect. So in effect, Germany had no choice but to crumble and to succumb and to surrender. They were not militarily capable of defending on two fronts. Their homeland was now invaded and their political will and their military capability was almost decimated. Edward Pelkey traveled to England while on a brief leave from his unit in the Netherlands. While we were there on leave, the war was so long. And uh, he picked up two girls, just casual, on the street. They said, we're going to movies. He said, we'll go to movies with you. We went to movies and said, and clock on the screen. Hostilities will cease at midnight tonight. This to include all naval ships in these areas. These forces to lay down their arms and to surrender unconditionally. And I remember just being a young fellow, 20 years old. I said, oh, we made it, we made it. But we went out on the street, and the people were just like that. And they were just swaying and celebrating, and I said to the wall, don't you go on that street. They'll trap you to death. We went up to The Hague in Holland. And the Germans were bringing their equipment all in to a certain spot. And I don't know how many tons of equipment they brought in there, but it was unbelievable the stuff they had. And a lot of men. And we were on one side of a canal, and there was a bridge still intact. And we had a guard on the bridge, and we were going down to the bridge. And the German prisoners walking up to the other side, looking across. To, we didn't go over and talk to them or anything. We could have walked across the bridge, but we didn't. And the next week they formed them up and marched them out of there. And that was the climax of the Second World War. They marched back to Germany on foot. That column was 
24 mile long. Nick Janicki. I can remember when the war ended on May the 5th, and uh, and we were in Leary, Germany, and uh, I guess it was May 5th, May, May 6th, the next day, this here troop of German soldiers just marching back home and singing Lily Marlene, eh? and they're just a whole line of them. I guess that they're going back home. The war was over, right? and, uh, and I guess they were happier than hell the war was over, too. If anybody ever experiences war, the destruction is almost possible to describe it. When we were on our way home, we went through Belgium, and we stopped at a uh, holding place there where we could stay overnight. And I said, let's go for a walk, me and another fellow. And we walked down to the town. It was a small city. And those buildings were half standing and half down. And there was rubble out in the streets. It just gave you an eerie feeling. And I said, I'm not even going down there. Just walked down the ways and turned my back. And you'd wonder how they rise from the ashes and build back. I've always said that, you know, we haven't done as good a job about letting the young people know really what happened during the war or keep them posted like they do, like the Dutch, you know, the Dutch, they embedded in their kids what happened and who saved them and that. And, I don't think at home, uh, I can't even remember in school where they ever <coughs> brought up the war years or anything, which I think they should have. I think they should have, you know? I think especially youth today need to have a true appreciation and understanding of what we as humans and Canadians and our ancestors went through to get us to where we are today. I think too many people neglect the fact of like what we have here, we had to truly fight for and earn, and that it wasn't given to us. And I feel like people truly dismiss and uh, neglect the history and appreciation for our soldiers. And it's sad to see, so I would like to see more kids show appreciation and do things to help veterans. Zach visits a war cemetery. It's important for youth to know this history about these veterans because it's our history. It's why we're able to have an iPhone. It's why we're able to play basketball, play sports. It's why we're able to go to the mall, ha have freedom. They gave us our freedom. And um, I don't think youth today understand that fully. And I think education is so, so important to everyone. Don Bradshaw. Yeah, it was a great honor to have Reg Harrison here to look at the aircraft. Uh, you know, he's uh, certainly underplays his part in the war, and he's certainly a great hero, along with a lot of other people that went there and did their jobs. And, uh, you know, he uh, he's an exceptional individual, and I'm very honored that he was able to be here with us today. Harry LaFont. I never heard him talk in the sense of being the liberator. In fact, it was just recently that uh, we really got a sense, you know, that he was in Holland at the end of the Second World War. That's not something he talked about very much, you know, not to us anyway, not to the younger generation. He wasn't one to put himself up front and try to make himself what he wasn't or what he didn't think he was, you know. He may have done his duty, and that's how he looked at it, you know. He did what he had to do because he signed up. Edward Pelkey. I mean, they lost their lives when they were 20 years old. And you have to question it sometimes. And here I sit, I got to live my life, had children and grandchildren, and still live them. There's an element, a little bit of guilt there. Why me? Photos show soldiers smiling and relaxing. But for some reason, to live. You know, I, I think it's all part of history. Jeez, you know, when you stop and think about it, uh, when the troops went over there, they went to war with, 
for a purpose that they wanted their freedom and they wanted to keep their freedom, eh? I keep thinking when I go back to Demeter and I think of Demeter, and I just, I keep thinking to myself, reminding, my, reminding myself of a line of people down the street on the rooftop and on the window they're just cheering because they've been freed. They've been freed, you know? And really were, you know? Black and white footage highlights the post-war celebration. In the present, the war vets greet a crowd lining a street. They smile and shake hands with individuals. Some of the enthusiastic people lean close to share words of appreciation. In memory of Joseph Perdue, 1921, 2017, a black and white photo displays him as a young man. Bert Lafond, 1925, 2003. A photo shows him parachuting. All the Canadian forces, men and women, who served and sacrificed. Freiheit. Freedom. This program was described by AMI-TV. Narrated by Joe Callahan. Executive producer and production manager, Philip Dirksen. Produced and directed by Anthony J. Tostego. Associate producer, Brian Swidrovich. Field producers, Tom Pearson, Newmarket, Ontario. Eric Brunt, Victoria, B.C. Researchers, Jeff Martell, Anthony J. Tostego, Brian Swidrovich, Malcolm Young. Director of photography, Shannon Scott. Additional cameras, Eric Brunt, Gavin Kood. Editor, Shannon Scott. The producers gratefully acknowledge the support of the following. Harry LaFond, Zach Perdue, Janice Swidrovich, Eric Brunt, Muskeg Lake Cree Nation, Honored Veterans, Colonel Malcolm Young, Retired, Reg Harrison, RCAF 431 Squadron, Jim Parks, Royal Winnipeg Rifles, Ken Newell, 3rd Canadian Anti-Tank Regiment, Edward Palkey, Carlton York Regiment, Nick Janicki, Canadian Scottish Regiment. Thomas Duroche, Calgary Highlanders. Chief Kelly Wolf, Royal Canadian Air Force CF-18 Demonstration Team. Dennis Banday Snowbirds, 431 Squadron. Royal Canadian Legion Dominion Command. Chad Wagner, Royal Canadian Legion Saskatchewan Command. Newtana Legion, Branch Number 362. Canadian Scottish Regiment Museum. Pat and Lorne Varga. Don Bradshaw, Saskatoon Museum of Military Artifacts, Saskatchewan Aviation Museum, Muskeg Lake Cree Nation, licensed by Accessible Media Inc. This program is dedicated to the memory and honor of those who served in the liberation of Holland and all veterans. Copyright 2021, Tomega Entertainment Inc.